done so. Hello. Hello, Madam Rita. Yes, good afternoon, Hannah. How are you? Fine, thank you. Sorry, I just joined the class. I came late. That's okay. We're happy that you're here. How are things in uh, Northern Ghana? Yeah, we are managing. It's, it's okay. Things are good. Uh, I just back from school. We close at one. Ah. I'm enjoying. Oh, okay. All right. Good. Uh, they're all just coming back from some group work, and so then we will continue. All right, thank you. All right, thank you too. <laughs> all right, welcome back everyone. Uh, were there any areas of struggle? Is there anything that you felt like uh, needs to be communicated better? Um, between those four concepts. This is Alex. We were only two in our room, so we were not as robust as we thought we could be. We covered <laughs> only two areas. Um, that is the church at the junction, and then or the other one was uh, um, uh, the, the, the goal of business. Okay. Um, uh, but my the fourth one would be my area of challenge and uh, need for uh, clarification. Okay, the ministry components of DML. That is true. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Anybody else? Was there specific areas? Um, and then the question is, do we need to review them together here, or can you do them as a as a team? Um, anybody have specific challenges? Yes, please. Yes, Adelai. Okay, for me, the church at the junction, I need more, more deeper uh, explanation so that I, it can stick into me. Okay. Uh, By the way, thank you for reminding me to record. Um, I had forgotten. Okay. Uh, okay. So who can help? Who can uh, give a good summary of the church at the junction? I don't know where there is the right there. Pastor Moses, are you uh, volunteering there? I can volunteer, I think. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, there are two concepts as a, the church. There is uh, this concept of uh, we come to church to get and then come to go. But tra or traditionally, oh, Commonly, especially in Africa and in Uganda, we have always said, come and get your miracle, come get your healing. And you know, that is the way we are locked. So we know we go to church to get, and that is the end of it. But come to go means you come to the church, you are empowered, equipped, trained to be released to go out in the workplace, in the marketplace, where we spend most of our time to have influence right there as the salt and the light right there. So the, uh, coming to church is not the end in itself, but it is just to be empowered to go and influence out there, which I think is the concept that DML embraces, as opposed to the former come to get and there you remain. Yes. That is the much I can go. Okay, and that's good. I mean, I think that, um... Uh, the, the thing to remember with COVID right now is that many churches have been shut down, right? Uh, and yet the church has not ceased to exist because the church is the people. And so one of the things that we want to be able to emphasize in the church at a junction is that the people who believe that we go to church in order to get, um, when the church is closed, there's nothing happening. But the people who believe that church is where it's about equipping, uh, where you come in order to go, we recognize that church actually begins on Monday. Um, Sunday is the equipping and the recharging at time. 
but church begins on Monday when the church, the people of God, leave the building and are equipped to act like the church, to be the light and the salt and the leaven every day of the week. And so that's a paradigm shift where if we continue to view the church as the building and the programs and the pastor as the only one who can hear from God or, or interact with God, um, then when the church closes, it's the building closes for COVID or for other things, uh, we have a major problem because we have not been equipping people to be transformational in their community. Good. Um, all right. What I would like to do now is um, I'm going to share my screen again. And there are four key themes. And so uh, regarding the four that we just did, um, those are things that we want you, if you saw that there is a shortfall in terms of, of like the components of DML, training, uh, mentoring, advocacy, uh, those are things that your, your, your host, your team, the DML team can, can go over with you. Um, but there's also these four key themes that I hope that you picked up on from uh, the facilitators over the last few weeks. And I would like for just some volunteers right now um, to help uh, add some context to some of these uh, as we went through them. So the first one uh, that we want to emphasize for people is God's intimate relationship with creation as well as his people. Uh, so is there anybody, and so, and then I'm gonna, you can think about these, I'll read through them all. The second one is that God is the owner and we are the managers. The third is that we need to work with capacity, compassion, competence, and courage. And the last is that we work with a quadruple bottom line, social, economic, environmental, and missional. And we see that these are themes because it's something that we expect people, the trainers, to come back to over and over throughout the 12 sessions, that we, we continue to come back to how this looks so that this is something that by the end of the 12 weeks, participants have a better idea of this as well. So can somebody add a little more uh, detail to the first one? Um, God's intimate relationship with creation as well as his people. Who can tell us a little bit more about that? Nicholas, go ahead. Yes, um, what I'm thinking is that when we look at creation, the Bible tells us God was made in, uh, man was made in God's own image. Uh, so we can see that after uh, man was created, God had fellowship with man. And God placed man in the garden to care. And he gave the commission or the commandment that God, uh, man should take charge over everything that was created. Meaning God has relation with man. Man should have relation with creation. And so creation and man, that of God, to have that relationship. So there should be that close interweaving relationship between God, man, and creation. And that is what I will understand by God's intimate relationship with creation as well as his people. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nicholas. That's right on. Uh, you know, if people wonder about that, because we get a lot of people who say, you know, it's all about saving souls and the earth mm. is going to burn. And um, uh, that's actually not the right interpretation of that verse, but it's, it's also throughout scripture, you see so many times where uh, the leaves of the trees will clap their hands, where the rocks are going to cry out, where, where this intimate relationship is there. But, but Genesis 9 is where that covenant, if you read Genesis 9, the covenant is reestablished with Noah after the flood. And there, I think, are four or five different times in Genesis 9 that God makes it clear the covenant is not just with the people, but it's with all living creatures. Um, and it's with creation. And so, uh, as Nicholas said, he created it. Uh, he's given it to us to care for. Uh, God cares about creation and has created the world for us to use, but also for us to subdue, which means uh, to, to care for and protect. Good. All right. Uh, God is the owner. We are the managers. Who can expand on that? 
I can see that two people raised their hand, but I can't see who. So maybe Emmeline, you can help me. Uh, David Emazu. All right, David, go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you, Doctor. I think um, the God as the owner and the man as the manager uh, brings the concept of stewardship and accountability. The fact that we are doing business, um, whatever we do uh, does not originate from us. And whatever we do in the business, one day we will have to give accountability for how we have uh, treated people, how we have used the resources God has put in our hands. And so God um, has given us these things. They are not ours. And so we needed to practice good stewardship as we do business and as we handle people, as we bring the kingdom of God, because one day God will actually pay us for the things we do. I love the idea of uh, uh, business, not for profit, but uh, the idea of business is to bring service close to people. The idea of business is to meet the needs of people socially, spiritually, economically, environmentally, but not really to make a profit because the owner is there. We are simply stewards to God as a project which has put in our hands to make his kingdom to be extended to all over the world. That is my understanding of God as a manager and we've been as, I mean, God as the owner and we've been as uh, managers. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, David, so much. That's uh, very good. The, and this is something that we just try to keep repeating and repeating. If people can go back to their business with that concept that God is the owner, we are the managers. Um, uh, as I mentioned, I think somebody put up under new management or under new ownership as a sign in their shop, just to, to try to reinforce that uh, as well. Let me just clarify, though, uh, that we are not um, against profit. Profit is very necessary for our business. If we want to be able to continue to do the thing that God has given us to do to help people flourish, that business has to make a profit so that we can continue to provide that. So. But the goal is not profit. As David said, the goal is to help people flourish. The goal is a quadruple bottom line. Profit is one of those in the, in the economic bottom line. Um, but there's a social and an environmental and a missional goal as well. Um, and, and so keeping that proper perspective on where profit fits, um, you know, we will lose business people if we say that, that we don't like profit. Um, because one of the reasons, the reality is the most of us start doing business because we need to provide something for our families and that's good and important. Uh, but we have to keep the proper perspective that, um, that God is the owner and we do that in a way uh, that still keeps the, the customer and the employee in mind. All right, the third one, we need to work with capacity, compassion, competence, and courage. If you remember, we talked about this with the Good Samaritan. Um, and, uh, and so who would like to expand on, on this one a little bit? Any volunteers? All right, let me expand on this one then. When we say we want to work with compassion, I'll start with compassion. Most people, the Good Samaritan had compassion, right? Good Samaritan saw the person laying on the ground and even though the person was a Jew and he was a Samaritan, he had compassion. Whereas the priest and the Levite did not, or we don't know really what was going in their head, they didn't show compassion. But compassion is not enough. We need to also have capacity. And that is where business people often come in. Um, the priests, the Levites, they may have had compassion in their heads and their hearts, but they didn't have the capacity to be able to stop. The, the, the Samaritan had a donkey. He had money to be able to pay the innkeeper. He had bandages and wine in order to treat some of the wounds and, and clean them. Uh, and so we have to have compassion. That's very important. Some business people lose compassion. They, they tend to say, you know, I did it, you can do it too. 
We need to have compassion as Christians. That's where our social bottom line comes in. But we also have to have capacity. That's where our economic bottom line comes in. When I have capacity, I can have a social bottom line and a missional bottom line. But we need to pair compassion and capacity with competence. Sometimes the way we want to help people is not really helpful. Uh, we, sometimes we want to keep giving aid, giving assistance, and we're not challenging people to do what God has given them to do, that they have the capacity themselves uh, to take care of themselves. And so we need competence as well. And lastly, the Good Samaritan had courage. It took a lot of courage for him to pick up that, that, that Jew who was injured and to put him on his donkey. What if the man had died? Uh, as a Samaritan, what would that look like? Would he have been charged with murder? Uh, would he have been killed himself for maybe moving the person, you know, when they shouldn't have been? Um, there was courage in that action. And so as business people, as the church, uh, where 95% of us are involved in the marketplace, we need to have compassion, absolutely. But we also need capacity. And capacity, again, churches don't make money. Um, government only gets money from um, business people. Uh, get, business is the area where wealth is created, not in the church, not in education, not in government. Business is where that happens. So we have to have capacity. Then we have to have competence. We have to know when and where and how to help. And then it takes courage for us to do that. Uh, so those are the four things that we want to remind people. Uh, some people uh, do their business and it's all about compassion um, and, and they don't develop the capacity. And so they are helping people and giving things away and that's great, but after a year or two, they're out of business. Um, and so there has to be a balance in these areas for how we help and when we help. And, and that's why we recommend a social bottom line that you define, this is what I can do. Um, but I can't, I have limits, right? From the, the love, the boundaries, we have limits. We can't help everybody. Um, and so uh, we have to put some limits on those. All right, the last one, we work with a quadruple bottom line, the social, economic, environmental, and missional. You can remember that by having the word seem, S-E-E-M, if that's helpful. Um, who would like to expand on the quadruple bottom line? You can put their hand up. Shall I try? Yes, please, Joseph, go ahead. Yeah, most business people uh, think that their business has only economic purpose. That's not correct. According to the Bible, based on our DML trainings, God has quadruple bottom lines for our businesses, not only economic purpose. Our business has social purpose. We have to be a blessing for our neighbors, our customers, for church, for our country. So our business should contribute something for our societal challenges, problems, needs. That's God's purpose. He wants us to be a blessing uh, by using our work for our social uh, uh, problems. The other one is environmental. Our, we should have healthy relationship with our environment. When we work, different businesses, uh, environmentally, it should be healthy. It should not affect our environment rather contributing positively for our surrounding, for environment. That is God's purpose. The other one is missional or spiritual. Uh, God wants us to be the, a light and salt for uh, others in our market, in uh, our marketplaces, not only getting money, not only helping others, we have to contribute 
on their spiritual life, their relationship to God. That's also God's purpose uh, in our uh, businesses. So uh, quadruple bottom lines means social, economical, environmental, and missional. Not only economic purpose, God has four purposes in our businesses. Yeah, I think that is the central Excellent. idea. Thank you so much, Yosef, for that. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. And, and uh, so it's, again, we encourage people to, to come up with these goals. Um, and that's the last activity that we will be doing together today is to look closer at those goals as it relates to these four. Uh, one thing I want to point out is um, it, the, the original from the Luzon Commission, the quadruple bottom line, was social, economic, environmental, and spiritual. And we decided a few years ago for DML that we were going to change that word spiritual to missional. I just wanted to make sure that you understand why we did that. Um, everything is spiritual. And so what we want to reinforce is, is what we don't want to reinforce is the dichotomy between what is considered sacred and what is considered secular. And so we want to say that our social bottom line is a spiritual bottom line as well. Um, it is God's calling for us to fulfill the great commandment. The economic bottom line is a spiritual bottom line as well because we are being fruitful and multiplying. The environmental bottom line is a spiritual bottom line as well because God told us in Genesis 2.15 that we need to work and care for creation. And so that is why we changed the last one to missional. Everybody is to be on mission. We are all to be on mission to make disciples. Um, so it, it's okay to use the word spiritual, but just know that when we do that, we think that we're reinforcing this dichotomy. Um, and so uh, we wanna bring it back to, to missional for that purpose. All right, uh, let me continue on. And now I just want to do uh, some, some talking points about presenting and what does it mean to be a good presenter? Um, just to reinforce what we talked about a little bit in the beginning. Uh, one of the goals of the presenter is to provide an environment where learners feel relaxed, comfortable, and ready to learn. This means you as presenter are not rushed or worried about the process, and you have time to greet and pray as, as people come in and as you walk around the room. And so this comes back to the fact that we want you as trainers to be there first not to rush in after people are already there, to be praying uh, in the room, to be able to greet people. Time management, as we talked about yesterday, um, is, is very important. And so make it your habit to try to get there 30 minutes in advance if you need to, so you can set up, make sure everything is working, and then have some quiet time uh, with God. It's a good idea to have a checklist of things that you need for your teaching assignments. Um, presenters should have their equipment set up, tested, and ready before learners begin to arrive. And so, especially if you're using a projector and you're using the, um, the PowerPoints, um, making sure your speakers work. Um, uh, the frustrating thing is when we have to spend time on tech issues. And I know we had to do that for a few minutes um, here and there in our, in our time together, but the goal is to keep that at a minimum, to have practice ahead of time as much as possible, uh, so that people aren't distracted. What you don't want to do is be teaching an important point and suddenly it's lost because everybody is noticing that the subtitles stopped working. Uh, and they're all wondering when are the subtitles going to come back? And, uh, and so you want to not be a distraction for the message that God has for people. And so it's your responsibility to make sure that, that things are running as smoothly as you can uh, and even if the power goes off, that's happened so many times when we teach that you can just ignore the fact the power went off and keep going, uh, keep teaching, keep talking so that people can continue to stay with you and it becomes less of an, an issue um, as, as that goes on. All right. Um, when we talk about delivery, every presenter has their own style. Uh, but there are a few things to keep in mind while presenting. One of the reasons why I wanted other people to be teaching is because you've watched me uh, in the videos. And, um, it, you know, uh, it gets a little boring to watch the same person after a while. And it's good to hear the other ways that people have to present. 
Um, but there's something that, uh, that should be true for all of us, and that is to master the material well enough so that you can speak without the notes. For us, the, the slides are just the clue for what we need to do next. If we don't have anything that, that is prompting us, um, we can miss and forget important points that we want to make. But we shouldn't only read the slides and then go to the next one. Read the slide. Anybody can do that. Then you don't need a trainer. The, the slide is there to prompt you, to, to spark in you what it is that you need to be hitting in this particular slide. And so as a trainer and as your team is given the PowerPoints, uh, we've, we've given out the PDFs. We don't usually give out the PowerPoints until somebody is ready to train. Uh, you need to be sure that you understand what that slide is saying. And we may have written the slide in a way that makes sense to us, but it doesn't make sense to you. So you need to be responsible ahead of time to have reviewed the slides to make sure you understand it. And if you don't, either ask or hide the slide or change the wording so that it makes sense to you. Uh, once uh, you take this, you can make it your own. You can, you can change it, add in stories, and you, will, you saw that Dr. Gaga did that, and Emmeline did that, and Dr. Walker is always changing the slides. Um, and so you do that to make it your own, and that's fine to do that. Just keep the key points, uh, but make sure that you master the material. Connect through your passion for the material. Be enthusiastic and authentic when you're presenting. Uh, hopefully, as you hear this more and more, it settles into your heart. And that's something that we see um, in our teams over time is as people be present this more and more, God reveals to them in different ways as well, and that enthusiasm comes forward. Smile, make eye contact with the audience as you speak, move around, look at different people. Um, I had a pastor one time who only looked to the right side of the church. And it was very frustrating because those of us sitting on the left, we wanted, you know, to see his face as well. So make sure that you um, don't get into such a pattern that you're not, that you're missing out on people uh, as well. Vary your tone and rhythm so you don't lull people to sleep. Some people talk in a very monotone way and it gets very boring after a while and very soon you're not listening anymore. Even though your eyes are open, <laughs> um, you, 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 you don't catch what is being said. Remember the 30 minute rule. Um, the 30 minute rule is that people's brains can absorb information for about 30 minutes. And after that, they will continue to be looking at you and even nodding, but their mind is elsewhere. So it's not that you need to get up and have a break every 30 minutes. It means that we stop and we have a question. And now I'm not in the listening mode. I'm in thinking, how would I respond? That in itself is enough of a variation. Getting people to stand up is fine. Asking a question, showing a short video. That's why we have videos in um, the two-day workshop. We don't have as many videos in the um, SME, but, but give it, getting a small discussion is important. Just remember, you may be excited about your point. Now, I forget this often. I'm a, I'm a hypocrite when it comes to this. Um, you know, we may be excited about what we're teaching, but as a listener, it's just difficult after 30 minutes for our brain to keep taking in information. And so even though the crowd may look like they're attentive and they're with you, um, you need to be able to have some variation. If you ever watch Yosef um, preach or teach, um, he's having people laugh every 10 or 15 minutes. And that as well uh, is engaging and people stay with you. And it's not um, maybe because his content I thought his content is very good as well, um, but it's, it's, it's getting people's brain engaged in different ways that, that's important. Uh, where possible, remain on the same level. We've been in a lot of places where they want us to teach from a stage. They want us to teach from a, sto sto uh, uh, um, from a podium, find the word. And what we want, always want to do is to say, no, we want to be on the same level as the people, because when you remove yourself that far, it's difficult uh, to, to see people's faces, to interact with them, and to feel like you're on the same level with them. So that, that's our, our um, recommendation. Do not get in front of the projector. Some, some people love to teach with the slide um, on their belly, 
And um, that's very distracting for the crowd. You may not notice that you're standing in front of the projector and that the words are, are on you, um, but uh, it's distracting for them. So do your best to not stand in front of the projector. Make your gestures open and confident, larger than life. It may be uncomfortable to do that and it's difficult to do that in front of a computer. Um, but when you're in front of people, do that because it, it helps them engage in that way. Work at communicating through your body movements. This means stay away from crossing your arms. When I grew up in church, my father was the pastor and the children had to be very well behaved. And we were taught you had to cross your arms and cross your legs so that you weren't wiggling or moving. When I became an adult, my pastor, who is not my father now, told me, when I see you sitting out there and your arms are crossed and your legs are crossed, I feel like you're telling me I'm not open to anything you have to say. So he started teaching us to open our arms and, and remain in a posture that allows for receding. So we just need to know that our, our, our body movements have a way of communicating. Um, uh, you know, having your hands in your pockets, um, uh, turning away from the audience. And that, that is one thing that many of our trainers have a problem with. And we'll talk about that more with the PowerPoint. But when we have a, com a computer and we have a projector, our habit is going to be to turn and face the wall and talk to the wall where it's being communicated. Now, I don't know how good my mic is, but oftentimes it means that the, the, the audience is not hearing what you're saying and uh, you are losing uh, sight of what the audience is doing. And so it's very important to... <laughs> Um, in a way that people can see you. I like this slide. Um, this tells us about uh, nonverbal communication. The words that we use are only 8% of the message. It's amazing, only 8%. Your tone of voice is 34%. And then the nonverbal cues, what you're doing with your face, what you're doing with your hands, um, with your body, that's 58% of the message. And we forget that. We sometimes think it's all about the words, um, but it's so much more than that. And so it's something that we work on as trainers. Um, it's why after we give a training, um, Dr. Walker and I, almost every single time that we have a training, we will talk about two things, our message and our method. Uh, and we will critique each other and we will talk about the message. You know, you, this was good. I like this new story that you put in. Um, you you kind of missed this part though. Let's make sure that we emphasize this. That's the message part. And then we can trick each other on the method. You turned your back again to the audience a few times. Um, you you seemed a little flat. Uh, you, you didn't seem your normal enthusiastic self. What's going on? Uh, and so those are things that we want to do for each other as trainers. And that's why we encourage you uh, when you start training to have somebody else with you and ask for that feedback. Sometimes it's difficult for people to share the feedback, um, but it's important. As a trainer, I want to be committed to learn. I want to do the best that I can do. I want to deliver with excellence. And so getting that feedback is very important. I want to talk quickly about using PowerPoint. Um, PowerPoint is how we have presented this to you. There are many trainers who don't have access to are teaching in areas where there's not electricity excuse me or may not have a projector and so it's okay to use the manual to teach in the trainer's manual make sure that you're using the trainer's manual and the participant manual um, but if you have access to the powerpoints uh, it, it helps it helps the teaching uh, to to stay on point also I remember some of the that are not in the manual. Um, when you are using the power, PowerPoint, make sure that you practice ahead of time. Uh, ensure that you've mastered this, this remote um, that you use to forward the slides. Uh, sometimes if you don't have those, we're, we're really stuck to the computer and um, uh, having a remote and, and all of our teams have them allows you to move around and uh, without being stuck to, to the computer. 
Uh, check the equipment, uh, make sure that you have things. We always try to carry uh, you know, extension cords in case we can't get to the outlet, um, speakers in case they don't have a speaker system, um, and, and then again, make sure that your computer is set up in a way that allows you to see it, and you should be able to know what's there with a glance, uh, and then be able to address the, the audience. Uh, so don't turn your back to the people, don't read from the wall, read from the computer, and have it set up in a way that allows you to see them. Make sure the sound system is adequate, um, and uh, I started those other things. Some other tips, start on time. Yesterday we talked about time management. If you maintain the high standard of starting on time and ending on time, it may take a few weeks, but people will understand that they need to get there on time. Um, keep high standards as it relates to um, uh, turning in the assignments as well. Um, if, nobody, if somebody isn't turning in, check in with them. Uh, when you lower your standards, people will be happy to meet those lower standards. When you keep them higher, people will meet those higher standards as well. Um, Consider your word choice based on your audience. I remember teaching um, in Northern Ghana uh, and in the front row, I had a man who had his doctorate. We were doing the SME training, a man who had his doctorate and in the row behind him on the right side was a pastor who couldn't read or write. Uh, so you're going to have this diversity in your audiences um, in terms of education levels and you want to do your best to, um, to not speak down to people but to try to find the best fit that is uh, words that will, that will resonate with everyone. Um, and, and remember that the, that the curriculum that we've developed, our research has showed that um, it's not at all dependent on people's education level, their success. So it can fit for somebody who is not um, literate. It can also fit for somebody who has their MBA. Um, because it's very practical and, and that's the goal of this is not to help people get educated in, in a degree setting but in how to run their business uh, practically. Teaching with a translator. If you teach with a translator and some of you I know are doing that as you go to, to different regions even within your own nation where they speak a different uh, dialect, the temptation for you is going to be to talk to your translator the temptation for those in the audience is going to be to talk to the translator. You need to maintain the authority that you are the, the expert as it relates to this. Don't make the trainer the expert. So you make sure you speak to the people. And when people are asking a question, um, I've done it where my, they are talking to the translator and I will move almost in front of the translator, not to be rude, but to, to place myself there for the person to be looking at me while we're talking so that we keep that dialogue going. Uh, so there's just something to think about. Please, this next one is so important. Phones are always off when you're teaching. If you are part of a team, don't be on your phone or on the computer. If you're not teaching, but your colleague is up there teaching, put the phone away. Make it this a priority. Be fully present with people. Unless you're having people calling you for directions or something like that, then at least step out so that you're not a distraction. I've seen it so often when somebody allows themselves to get on their phone, it gives permission for everybody uh, to get on their phone. Nonverbal communication, we've talked about that. Dress code is part of nonverbal communication. Uh, we recommend that you dress as formally as the top 10% of your audience. That's not so much an issue across Africa. People know how to dress professionally. Uh, in the U.S., that tends to be a problem. We want to be as informal as we can. And so we recommend that you think, if you think somebody's going to show up with a suit and a, a tie, uh, that you show up as with a, a suit and a tie for men, for women. Uh, make sure that how you dress does not distract people. You want to not be a distraction. All right, and then we want to just think about stories. What is your story as you are a trainer? Telling stories of businesses uh, is important. The shortest way to the heart is through stories. Uh, the head does not hear until the heart interacts. Uh, we want to be able to communicate in a way, just as Jesus did with parables and stories. Uh, we need to have some stories as well for ourselves. And so it's important that you develop your own story for where you're training. If you have your personal stories, 
um, then that's good. Share those. But don't just share about yourself because otherwise people people like to put people in a box. That means after a while, if you continue to just share your story, people will say, well, that's you. You had this advantage and this, I don't have that. And so you want to bring in other people's stories as well and share. I know this woman from my church who X, Y, Z. I, um, I had an uncle, I had an aunt, I had a cousin, I have a friend. Uh, so develop your stories as it relates to uh, differences, urban, rural, uh, different levels of poverty, gender challenges. Uh, there are business challenges that people face on so many levels, and you also want to invite them to share stories as well. If you don't have a lot of stories, uh, then we recommend that you develop that by getting out there. Um, before you do a training, take a day to go visit some, some businesses and, um, and just ask some questions. And I guarantee you, it will enter your teaching. It will enter the way uh, that you teach. Uh, and so here are some ideas of how questions that you could ask uh, for if you're talking to business people. Tell me about your business, including when it started and how it changed over the years. What do you love about your business? What brings you joy? Uh, what are the challenges you face in doing your business? People love to actually talk about the challenges. So that's why we start with what do you love about it? Help them to think through the good things. Because when we focus on the glass that's half empty, it's very difficult to see the part that's half full. Uh, there are things that people love about their business that give you a clue as to their gifting. Um, some people are gifted in marketing. Some people are gifted in bookkeeping. Some people are gifted in goal setting. Some people love customers. Um, and so we have to look at, uh, when we ask them what they love, we get a sense of, of what they, uh, where their giftings are. You can ask them about loans. How many loans have they taken? That factors into some of the bookkeeping things that we talk about. How have you experienced the integration of your faith and your work? Um, how have you experienced the church's care and concern for your business? And so um, one of the things that we haven't shared yet, and we'll set up a Zoom call for this soon, is the research that was just completed in Northern Ghana, uh, where we asked some of these questions in the beginning of the research, which was in December of 2017. And then we asked some of the same questions after their church did this ministry for two years by the end of 2019. And it was very interesting to see some of the changes um, and some of the challenges uh, that, that were experienced during those two years. But asking these questions helps you uh, to really get a sense of uh, what is going on in the community and you can bring that into your teaching. If you talk to pastors and church leaders, you can ask them what are the challenges that business people face in your, in your context and in, in what you know. What do you believe is a perception of the church toward business and, and the opposite way? What percentage of the church is involved in the marketplace? What role can or should the church uh, play in the marketplace? Have, has the church done anything specifically to reach out to business people in the last year? And if yes, what? Uh, so all of these questions that if you ask them, it begins to help you understand. Um, again, you don't want to be uh, you are the expert in terms of being the trainer, but they are the expert in terms of business in their community, in their context, in their sector, in their industry, um, in their family. Uh, and the church also has something that, to offer in terms of sharing what is going on. Don't forget that after every um, uh, workshop that you do, you should be giving an evaluation. Uh, you should be giving a post-test. I will be sending out an, um, uh, an evaluation to you after your exam probably early next week, uh, requesting that you do that. And so if you can take the time to do that as a trainer, what worked well? We're going to do this again. We're going to do another TOT on Zoom. Uh, we already believe that we will take more time than what we did for this time, but we're, we would like more ideas and feedback. And don't be afraid of um, being critical. Being, being critical means to critically look at something and to offer input for how things can be better. And we don't want to just hear the, that was wonderful, um, even though it's, that's nice, the affirmation, but we also want iron to sharpen iron. That was wonderful and it could be even better. 
if this. And so we, at, we welcome that and we want you as trainers to also welcome that from your participants as well. All right, I want to end by giving one more um, group uh, um, dis discussion about goals. And then we're going to end in about 15 minutes. Uh, and then the quiz is going to, uh, the exam is going to open up. Uh, and I'll talk about that when we get closer to that time. But one of the things that I've seen is a challenge in those quizzes for, for especially quiz number four on how to do goals. And it's something that I see over and over again in our participants as well. Goals need to be smart. Um, Dr. Gaga talked to us about that. They need to be specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. And, um, and so one of the challenges, in fact, um, I'm gonna stop sharing. In fact, maybe instead of groups, um, I'm gonna decide whether we do groups or not. I think we're going to do groups. Um, what I would like us to be able to look at is, is a specific goal that you may have and then discuss together whether it's um, SMART. And so some of the, um, I'm gonna put this in here. In the group chat, uh, some of us had goals that um, I'm going to, um, uh, my missional goal is I'm going to bring people to Christ. Now, is that, let's, let's do as a group for a minute. Is that a SMART goal? For my missional goal, I'm going to bring people to Christ. Is it no, specific? No. Okay, no. what's the challenge with it, Isaac? Yeah, it's not SMART. It is not uh, time-bound. It doesn't have a time. And it's not specific. We don't know how many people you're targeting to bring. So I think those, those, those two elements are missing. Good. Okay, but so it's not measurable because we don't know how many people and it's not time bound. Um, we also therefore don't know if it's attainable or realistic, right? If I say I want to bring two people to Christ, well, that might be attainable. You might be able to do that. It might be realistic for you given your time constraints. But if I say I want to bring 2,000 people to Christ and I'm doing a, a business um, you know, that, ha that is growing, that might not be attainable or realistic. So make sure that you have it measurable and time bound. What if I want to um, open a new shop um, in an adjacent uh, city um, by uh, December of this year? Is that a SMART goal? I want to open a new shop uh, a second shop in an adjacent city, maybe 50 kilometers away, uh, by December of this year. Is that smart? Smart. It's a smart goal. Okay, why, Isaac? It, it has a time bound. It is specific. You want to open another shop, and uh, it has a time limit <laughs> when you're supposed to. So you can evaluate yourself. It's measurable. Yes, you can measure whether you have attained or not been attained. And it's also realistic. Hopefully, you have the money and the, the, all the uh, requirements to do yeah. that. <laughs> so, and that's the tricky part. Thank you, Isaac, for that. So I can look at somebody else's goal and I can see whether it's specific, I can see if it's measurable, and I can see if it's time bound. What I don't know is whether it's attainable or realistic because I don't know your context. I also don't know, so that's attainable. Do you have the customers? Um, have you done the market research, the feasibility study? Is it realistic for you? Do you have the money? That's what that question is asking. It's not, can I do it, but should I do it? Is, is it realistic for me in terms of my time? Do I, am I going to be able to find somebody to, to staff that one? And so on. So I'm gonna send you into groups. And what I want you to do is to share one of the goals or make up a goal and talk about whether it is a SMART goal because this is critical for our businesses to be able to achieve their goals. Every business has a goal. And uh, I've never met a business that doesn't have a goal. But being able to achieve those goals, to be successful with those goals is a huge challenge. Um, and, and this is, a, I think, what's very important that we look at. And as trainers, when they turn those assignments in, that you can give some feedback 
especially because you know the context and hopefully you know the people, um, you can tell whether it's attainable or, or achievable as well as realistic. So um, let's have uh, our, uh, Emmeline send us into our groups. I'm going to give you uh, 10 minutes um, and then we will come back, talk about the exam and then uh, be on our way. So uh, make sure that you get a chance to share and give some feedback as to, uh, it's best if it's a personal goal so that you can actually identify with what people are saying. If you have to make something up, then make something up. Thank you. Please look for your invitations and accept them. And let's get going into our rooms quickly. Again, 23 seconds. So, when do we get the picture at the end? Yeah, I think so. Okay. That's the 10 minutes telling me it's time. <laughs> oh, wow, you are good. <laughs> Just, I learned I can look in the chat to see what I put the, the time that I put the chat in there. There's everybody. All right, welcome back everyone. Thank you. Uh, I hope that's helpful. Uh, we won't take the time to go through that, but um, again, I can't emphasize how important it is. I'm going to mute everyone. All right. So uh, make sure that you take your time to look at your goals, make sure that they are smart, uh, and then make sure that there are good objectives and strategies. So again, you want to back yourself up all the way to today. What do I need to do today to be successful with this goal in six months or in one year or in two years? All right, um, that brings us to the end of what we wanted to cover. Um, let me just talk about the exam. Uh, when the exam opens up, it will open up in about two minutes and it's going to be open for 24 hours, okay? So you can, if you have any connectivity issue, you should be able to get on within the next 24 hours. If you are not able to, please connect with your, um, with your DML leader. Um, so that they can work out how you can get the exam and still take it if you have an issue that prevents you in the next 24 hours. When you open it up, you are going to see that there's the, the quiz type document. And, um, and you can take that, but the last question is what I want to talk about. The last question is tied to an Excel document. So when you see that Excel document, I would start there myself. Um, I, you click on the Excel document, you have it open up in Google Docs, and then there are some, some transactional um, analysis that the document is asking for you to do. At the end of that, you will have done a balance sheet, okay? And the balance sheet is supposed to balance, right? It will give you how much the assets are and how much are the liabilities and owner's equity. That number is what you need to take now to the quiz document uh, to select the right answer there, okay? So that's why I would say do the Excel document first. Um, it will save it and I've, I've assigned each one to each of you so that you don't have to worry about how to save it. Uh, I'll be able to see your work there, but you take that final number to the other document, okay? Again, if, this is, if that part is very frustrating for you, it's okay. It just means that you need more practice before you teach the bookkeeping um, components. Um, but for the rest, I also said for this not to give you a grade right away because it's been frustrating for you when you get a grade and not all the questions are graded. The Google is not able to handle anything where there's multiple choice or check all those that apply and so on. So I will grade those, get them back to you as soon as I can. Uh, our goal, though, is to see whether we did a good job of teaching. 
Um, our goal is to see whether where there are some areas you're ready to trade in and some areas you may need more practice in. Overall, people have done very well with the quizzes. Um, and again, it, if you don't use it, you will lose it. And so our, our challenge now is to get you in front of people training uh, so that you can continue to remember what you have learned. If you don't use it, uh, you will lose it and it will be difficult for you to, to continue to um, feed that fire so that you can add more of yourself into that as well. All right, so uh, what I would like to do before I ask uh, Dr. Gaga to close us in prayer is I would like to take a class picture. Um, and so I would like everybody to turn their video on and um, we're going to take a class picture uh, such as it is in, uh, in 2020 with COVID. Uh, there we go, beautiful. If you have video and you can turn it on, I'm going to say, oh, amazing. What about us? We don't have video. I mean, our camera is not working. My oh, camera sorry, is not working. We, we see you there, though. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Um, Alex, I don't see your face. Pastor Alex. All right. All right. All right. There you go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Are you ready? Say cheese. Yeah. Cheese. All right. And now I need to go to the next slide. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> All right, yeah. cheese. Good. And one more. Wow. Everybody showed up and stayed to the end. All right. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Let me ask you to send it. Now to close us. Thank you. To send to I will us. send you the pictures, by the way. <laughs> thank you. God bless. God bless. Okay, okay so thank can we go you. to the Lord in prayer? Yes. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you very much. Father in heaven, we exalt your name. We thank you because God, you are worthy. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for the opportunity as we walked through the last four weeks together in understanding the small and medium, medium scale enterprise. Thank you for the training. Thank you for helping us to move in as facilitators. Father, I pray for every participant that God, you will give us grace and wisdom so as we're able to uh, move into engaging our community, engaging our church, engaging our people around us, that God, you will lead us to the right people in the name of Jesus. Help us, Lord Jesus Christ, not to go for the crowd, but to go for the vo for, to hear your voice and go for the selected people you desire to impact so that we can have a greater transformation in our community. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, because you will raise committed Christian businessmen across Africa. And Lord Amen. Jesus Christ, businessmen that will take over the, the country's economy, businessmen that Amen. will take over, Lord Jesus Christ, the nations, and be able to bring glory to God even through our transaction. Give us Amen. open doors. Give us breakthrough. Lift the people out of poverty into flourishing in the name of Jesus. We are asking Amen. that God, you will help us to lead and to implement the great commitments, Lord Jesus Christ, that you have given to us and to bring flourishing even on earth. As in the Lord's prayer, it is saying that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. We pray for Renita, Dr. Walker, Emmeline, and the team in the U.S. Lord, yes. they are tirelessly doing a lot for us. They are engaging us day and night. Father, replenish their strength in the name of Jesus. The Lord King of glory, the knowledge you have given them, you will continue to improve and increase in the name of Jesus. We want to thank you, Lord, because you bless their family, bless the, their work, oh God. And Lord Jesus Christ, sustain them and keep them. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for your love and your kindness. We bless your holy name. Receive all the glory. We ask all this believing, oh God, you have heard and answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you all so much. Amen. Thank you, Anita. Bye. 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 Hi, Yosef. I think our meeting is not far from now, so don't go too far.
<laughs> Thank you all for joining. God bless you all. Thank you. Amen. Bless you too. Thank you. Thank you so Amen. much. It's an amazing session. Kwame wrote, my hair is a mess. Kwame. Uh, okay, so can I ask my question now? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Uh, the first question I wanted to ask is, um, in, uh, in we'd be talking about business and we've looked at different options, different aspects of business, but I just realized that we didn't really look at the aspect of being a pioneer, that's pioneering a new business. Mm. And um, if you want to pioneer a new business, in a, I think there are quite a, a lot of things that one may need to look at. Yes. And so if we are training people on this and there are new businesses they could go into mm -hmm. in their locality, what are, are the different areas that we, we need to incorporate in it? Like I was looking at how to introduce <coughs> the new product into the community how to make it relevant, how to break even, how mm -hmm. to get it uh, registered, and quite a number of things to go with starting something new in a place that it has not been done before. So that's the yeah. first question. Okay, so let me answer that one quickly. Um, our, the micro-business training uh, is kind of designed towards the new startups. And there's a section in the manual um, that talks about what, what you need to do to start a new business in terms of the feasibility study and things like that. Um, remember that our goal for DML is mostly to work with those who are doing something. That's, that doesn't mean that they might not change their business. And so still those same questions are, are relevant um, so you could look at that and see whether that helps. Um, the, I don't think the micro business manual is on Google Classroom, so maybe I'll put it up there. I can, um, or I know that Dr. Gaga has it in Freeman. Um, but those are that would be something I would want you to take a look at and and see um, whether that's. Okay. All right. Then the second question is. Um, we need to work with capacity, compassion, competence, and courage. Yes. I, I, there is one, one of our, my colleagues that I was discussing with uh, not too long ago, and she was saying that in Malawi, you are not allowed to, to touch somebody if, like if there is an accident, and mm. people are involved in that accident. You, you don't touch them. You don't do anything. You could, maybe the highest you could do is to even call the security or, or maybe who can attend to them. And even, even that, a lot of caution, a lot of care has to be put in place so that you are not roped with uh, maybe the person who, is, who caused the the accident. So people have to be very careful. So sometimes you are in a scene where you see somebody who is in a, a very bad situation and you needed to attend to the person. But because of the law, the laws in the environment, those laws are put there, but the laws are not competent. You know, like in the third world country where you don't have the police really available. You don't have the, you don't have the uh, uh, fire service medically available, but you are asked not to touch somebody who is in danger. So looking at the story of the of the, uh, the, the good Samaritan, he could do that because there is no law that is going to rob him into, into trouble. So in a place where you have such law in place and you want to also be, you know, to practice what yeah. we're learning now. How, how do we go about it? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a, a troubling law for sure. Um, 
because you you're you're in a conflict right between obeying the law versus having compassion um and i you know i i i wouldn't know how what the right thing would be to do other than to i need to understand the law better uh, you know as the goal that people are not further injured um but it's a it's a balance that we have to to take and sometimes we take those risks um that that we can take just like the good samaritan took some risks um it might have been against the law for him to touch in fact some of the the things that they said is that the priest and the levite it may have not have been something that they were allowed to touch someone who was unclean um and so was it the right thing to do certainly in jesus's analogy in the parable it doesn't sound like it was that they walked by but i certainly wouldn't want to say in any situation without knowing a lot more but those are the things that we need to wrestle with and we need to talk with others who are in the context to say what what do we do what is the you know what are the caveats the ways out um and sometimes people know that in in a situation they know well they do that for this reason but um you know if you do end up helping somebody and your goal is helpful and you actually save them nothing will happen uh, so I think you, you, we just need more information on that. But that's a, it's a troubling, troubling lot. Sure. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for that and for your thoughtfulness yeah. and your, um, your your desire to uh, to engage this material. I love watching uh, how you're doing that. Okay. Can I say something on it? Yes, Dr. Gaga, go ahead. Um, okay, yes, I think I'm um, anti Bosse. Um, when it comes to that, looking at different cultures, um, uh, for me, I will see someone in Malawi, if uh, you're not expected to touch um, someone, is uh, reporting to a health sector or the police to come and help someone is confidence in itself. You, know, you, you must not be the person that will bandage, and you must not be the person that will do everything. But an attempt to be able to save a life, report to the right authority, do something so that a quick um, attention is given to someone in need, I think by that, it's already competence because some people will just pass by and say, hey, I'm not doing anything about it. So that's my take on that, uh, depending on where uh, someone is coming from. That's good, thank you for that. Um, Adela, I want to say, if you're still there, I forgot to put the um, video on Google Classroom. I uploaded it to YouTube and then didn't change it. So I will do that right now, and then you'll be able to have access to session 11 and 12. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, everyone, uh, we're going to uh, let you go so you can work on your exam. It should not take... Um, but then we will uh, be in contact with you after that.